Welcome to the official European League of Football podcast. I am your host, Nick Alfieri, a.k.a. Nalf, and we're going to have a lot of podcast episodes for you coming this season. We're going to dive into a bunch of different stories and conversations with people around the league. I'm super excited to bring them to you. First episode we have for you guys for 2023 is with head coach of the Stuttgart Surge, Jordan Newman. He is facing the uphill battle of rebuilding a team that did not win a game in 2022. We sat down for a great conversation at the Stuttgart Surge home stadium, Gazi Stadion in Stuttgart. Without further ado, Coach Jordan Newman. Got the European League of Football official podcast. Got Coach Jordan Newman here, head coach of the Stuttgart Surge. Coach Newman, let's dive right into it. You have been the head coach of the Surge for about six months now. Talk to me. How are things going? Going good. It's exciting. Uh, a lot. You know, the, the thing I realized the most over the last six months is that uh, compared to coming from the GFL, there's just kind of a lot that more goes into it. Um, and that goes from anything to just like uh, office stuff that has to be has to be done and taken care of to make all this function and run to um, you know, getting players and contracts and stuff like that, that creates just kind of a whole different element to all this. Um, uh, so you, you certainly see the, the workload and everything it takes and the effort to, to make it all run and go because it, it becomes much more uh, than just football. Do you like that aspect of it, having more of a, of a profession, more professional elements surrounding the football, or does it take away energy that you put to the football field? Certainly, you got to have to. You got to try and balance it as best you can. Yeah. But having this element, I think, is what ultimately creates the ELF and what it is and what it's able to do. Um, because even if I think you look from a, a league standpoint, from the ELF, it's not just football. It's it's very much uh, the entertainment value of it all. They've been able to tap into, which ultimately brings fans, which ultimately. Uh, makes a league run so it's just a, a a necessity i would say okay yeah i i like what you said there i mean the how i've thought about it is basically the 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 packaging of this product like football the product of football in in germany and in europe has been solid for a few years in my opinion when we were playing in 2018 19 some of the some of these games and the level of play was really solid but the packaging and promotion wasn't there and what i really like about how the elf has come along and really package it together nicely for the consumer to consume the product of European football. And uh, it's really just like elevating the game overall. I think. Yeah, I mean, ultimately that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to get people into the stands. Yeah. You're trying to get people to watch on TV. You're, you're, you know, I don't want to say that's your first goal because, you know, your, your first goal is to create the best football product you possibly can and, and put it on the field and have great teams going against each other and, and have uh, – a competitive balance more or less yeah. um, that you're looking for whenever you hit the field that you know games are going to be relatively close and um, it's not just kind of decided when you step out onto the field but like all, like I said like that element of you got to get people in the stands and you, you got to create something people want to consume yeah and it's just the, the competition aspect of it too I think you know high tide raises all ships I think that's just going to bring out the best in everybody and you've had the experience where uh, in the past couple of years, you haven't had that competition on a week by week basis. How are you feeling about going into a, a new challenge, a new season with the the element of legit competition every single week? You've got to you've got to claw it out every week. Yeah, that's what makes it exciting, and and that's one of the reasons we wanted to get in. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's no doubt over the last you know few years or so. I mean, there there were certainly a handful of games where. Um, you know, we would just walk in and kind of know it was kind of decided before it started. Um, you know, in, in the GFL, especially from speaking of the GFL South perspective, um, you know, that's why we went out and sought out these CEFL tournaments we were in for a couple of years. And then, you know, once you hit those playoffs in the GFL, that's when it really ramped up and the intensity got even higher. And, um, you know, German Bowls, of course. And, and the feeling is now going into the ELF and this year is you're going to kind of have that environment on a weekly basis uh, more or less because it is going to be uh, truly a week-to-week -week challenge and there is no more walking onto the field and, and knowing there's a handful of games you can cross off your your uh, schedule as, as wins they're all going to be pretty challenging and, and tough yeah the there's a i think they call it the the way too early preseason rankings of the european league of football 
Stuttgart Surge came in at seventh on that list. And however, that all that seventh place position also put them at first in the central conference. What is your initial reaction to something like this? Uh, that it's it's very you know speculative, mm -hmm. you know for sure. Uh, but that's what makes it. That's pretty cool though. That's another thing I saw is it's pretty cool just to see different lists come out and people are like already interested on preseason rankings. You know it has a very college football feel to it. Yeah. Like like even that matters. Yeah. You know um, that creates kind of just talking points and people engaging back and forth. Is this correct? Is this not correct? Um, you know, but from a, a football standpoint, from a, a football coach, um, you know, it's uh, myself, you know, you look at it and you're like, okay, cool. You kind of just take it for what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't care if you're one or 17 on that list. Um, this is, you got to go out and prove it and earn your spot yeah. um, here in about six weeks. Yeah. I mean, I like, I saw that on Instagram and I, I went in the comments there and it, you know, it got some people fired up. It pissed some people off seeing a list like that. But ultimately what it does is it, it sort of starts the storytelling process of the season. And that's what's super exciting about the Elf so far is that there's, of course, there's the sport element of it, but there's the storytelling element of it as well. The story of the whole season and these teams coming and going and, you know, rising and falling and, and new people on the block. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool thing. I was pretty, pretty excited when I saw that. And just the, the quality of these types of, of these types of graphics and visuals and it's a it's a really great way for the fans to consume i wanted to ask you sort of about the expectations of the surge like everybody knows the story of the surge surge did not win a game in 2022 i think won one game or two games in the first season you're coming in here now with what what many people would describe probably as pretty high expectations and with expectations probably comes a little bit of pressure. How, how do you feel about this situation? You know, I feel, I feel good about it. I feel excited about it. I mean, you know, um, you know, I don't think I would like a situation where the expectations are really low and, hey, let's just kind of do what we can do. And, you know, we're going to be very accepted regardless and um, accepted as, you know, the results will be accepted regardless. Um, you know, I think myself, my coaching staff, the players we got, you know, everybody wants those expectations to be high and, and they should be high. Um, just especially with uh, what I feel is a, an extremely talented coaching staff, an extremely talented roster. I think the expectations should be high. And I think we should, uh, you know, for ourselves as a football team, strive not necessarily to meet expectations of, of the, you know, surrounding um, community, I would say, let's say. Uh, but the expectations we have for ourselves are extremely high, and that's really what we're going to try and hit. I know that's that's cliche in a sense, but um, I mean we're we're grinding to you know uh, try and do something really special. Yeah, and I like what you said this past weekend at practice um, with the fact that there there is a new perception of the surge so far this year. But you said basically. Yeah, but that doesn't really matter. We have to earn that. We have to earn everything. Like you said about the other stuff, it's all speculative. Um, so I do, just having been at surge practices and around the surge so far, I really like the kind of the mindset of the team going forward and going into the season with that. You touched on the coaching staff, the roster. You've had a lot of continuity with your coaching staff coming from last season to this season. How has that helped when trying to build a new team uh, i won't say building from scratch but to, to really rebuild how has that helped having that continuity of people you've worked with for years yeah it just puts you ahead of the game like if i was coming in here with like an all-new coaching staff and we're learning each other's playbooks and we're just learning each other and how we work and what the philosophy and what the culture you know we're trying to set is um you know i certainly think that would have been a lot more work to try and get it done just because we were able to really more or less stay together, you know, it helps, like I said, just put us ahead of the game and, and, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, you know, all of our coaches getting on the same page of what we're trying to press forward to the players as far as the culture we're trying to build and how we do things in practice and, and uh, just how we do things, you know, on and off the field, just kind of like the overall culture. It just, um, it helps so much that I know that's already in place and, and being taught the right way. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, just having these guys that you've worked with for, for a few years, some longer than others, but yeah, the, the culture that's kind of been established and to be able to kind of have that from 
from the get-go and not have to build that amongst the staff from the start. It seems like it's it's off to a good start. Uh, we talked a little bit right when you took the job and you started recruiting. And you really had to piece together this roster. Aside from talent, is there anything that you were really looking for in in a surge guy, a guy that you wanted to bring onto this roster? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a certain level of character. Yeah. There's a certain level of just kind of on field, um, the way they the way they handle themselves on field, uh, on the field, the way they handle themselves on the sideline, um, in the meeting rooms. Um, just kind of an overall, just is this guy going to contribute to chemistry or is he going to take away from chemistry? Right. You know, and really those are the guys uh, we really sought out as much as we could and tried to make sure we built a roster with those type of guys. Mm -hmm. Central Conference. Like I said, and of course very speculative, but the surge are in the uh, near the top of that Central Conference with these speculative rankings. Who are some of the teams that you're really looking forward to having some challenges with uh, in this conference? Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at it in the conference, I mean, you know, the Raiders for sure. You know, I mean, that's a, a traditional power, not just created in the elf, but over a long period of time here in Europe, yeah. you know, um, uh, who I've uh, played against a lot mm -hmm. or coached against a lot, I would say over the past 10 years. And it's just, you know, one year after the other, you know, just bringing a tradition of, of you know, great football, professional coaching, professional atmosphere. Um, so I would say, I would say them for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then uh, the rest, I mean, we have so many teams that have just kind of been uh, founded, yeah. I would say, you know, like Munich and <clears throat> Switzerland and Milan, you know, so we got a handful of teams that this is their first year, you know, in the L. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they've been able to handle, you know, this six months uh, of putting together a team. And, you know, for the most part, you know, it seems like Munich and Milan both just had a very strong foundation that they were able to kind of pull from. Yeah. So I don't feel with those places you're really seeing brand new football teams necessarily. There's probably a lot of organizational type stuff yeah. that's new, uh, which creates its challenges. And then even when you look at Switzerland, um, I honestly don't know about the overall just pure depth right. in that country, but I do know from experience, like we had, I, we had uh, four or five Swiss guys with us with the unicorns last right. year who were just absolutely outstanding <sighs> football players. Ballers. And if there's, if there's more than those four or five guys or guys like them in that league, which I assume there is in Switzerland, yeah. um, I would assume there's 22 to 25 guys like that. I mean, that's that's a legit football team. Like I said, I can't comment on the overall depth because right. I don't know it, you know, the the overall country that well. So, um, you know, those I would those would be my comments on those teams. Right. And then Barcelona, um, you know, maybe just a little bit of a question mark. Just I mean, it seems like they've done a good job of the first couple of years, yeah. uh, attracting some stars and some big names and and having some success at times. And so you just you know, it's interesting to see what they've kind of been able to to kind of rebuild and remake there this yeah. offseason. Yeah, well, like we, as the Unicorns played the Kalanda Broncos, um, one of the best teams in Switzerland, and just seeing how, how big of a fight that game was and what kind of the level of talent in Switzerland. I do feel like Switzerland is a little bit underrated when it comes to football talent. Um, I feel like their stars are underrated. Yeah. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because like I said, I don't, I don't know about the depth, but – I mean, they've got they've got their their top name players are some of the top players yep. in Europe. I mean, they've got like real guys down there playing football. Absolutely. Yeah. How about Paris? Paris is uh, getting a lot of getting a lot of buzz. New team. Uh, head coach Mark Mattioli, who you coached against before uh, in the CEF ball against uh, when he was coaching for the Palmer Panthers. Paris is putting together what seems to be a pretty solid roster, and this is who the Surge are opening up this season with. What are your thoughts on on this team and preparing for this opening game? It's a really interesting game, right, because Stuttgart Surge went through such a transformation over the last six months, and then Paris is a new team um, with a lot of appeal, you know, just the city of Paris. And then just overall, France is a very good track record of producing really great football players, right? And then 
and then you have that one team in the entire country so it's able to pull the entire country uh, into that one team uh, which certainly uh, has its advantages that come with that um, you just um, they did a good job of getting their imports uh, you know I think they probably hit on hit on most if not all of them of who they brought in uh, there there'll be a well coached team um, so it's a really it's a really attractive first game for us. It's a really attractive first game to go on the road, nice stadium, um, a team that carries a ton of hype, you know, with Paris. Um, so it, it's going to be, I'm sure that's going to be a game that a lot of people are wanting to watch, you know, in that week. Absolutely. The Ryan Fire this is another team that uh, has gotten a lot of buzz and, and putting together a great roster and came out at number one on these preseason rankings. A couple guys on the team that we know, Jadrian Clark, quarterback, Nathaniel Robitaille, wide receiver, two of the imports, uh, really talented roster. What are your opinions on this squad? I mean, certainly did a great job of putting together a roster and building over kind of, you know, just the building off the, the history they have there yeah. and really using that. I mean, that's, that's a team who I think's kind of set the standard a little bit in Europe from a – speaking from an organizational standpoint and mm -hmm. what they're able to do as far as the fan base and, and the kind of some professionalism to it and stuff. So uh, so they've obviously done a good job. I mean, with Jadrian and, and Roby, I mean, those are two great players who I'm sure are able to pull um, some of their, uh, you know, overall, you know, wide receiver QB on the same page type of stuff they've had from the past and just continue to build off of it, even though Jadrian came in there late yep. uh, last year. Uh, but. Uh, certainly, I mean, when you see it, when just like overall national team players, I think they had 18 or something like that. So when you have 18 national team players uh, combined with, you know, your imports coming in and just building your roster, I mean, it's certainly uh, a good team and uh, done a good job putting together a roster. And, you know, I don't think too many people would have uh, a ton of arguments, you know, putting them at number one. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they like anybody else, you know, just got to go earn it. Did you always want to be a football coach? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I probably wanted to be a football coach more than I wanted to be a football player. Yeah. You know, even from a young age, yeah. You know, I played, ended up playing high school, college, played four years out here and everything mm -hmm. like that. But, um, you know, with a lot of football players like yourself who are probably still thinking about, you know, wanting to play maybe a little or how difficult it is to stop. I'm teetering. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, as soon as I took the pads off, I never wanted to step really? foot back on the field ever again. Yeah, I was ready to coach and – never never had that itch again to go play do you think that was just because you had such a strong desire to coach that you probably just knew exactly like hey i'm still gonna be around football and it's gonna be in this medium i'm gonna be a coach i think that's what it is it's yeah. just you had i had such a strong passion for going to the coaching route that it was like okay i'm still a part of the game yeah. and, and i have that passion to do my next step and it's very clear as opposed to a lot of guys they're done and it's like okay well do i want to coach now or right. do i want to play one more time and it, I assume that's a it's a more difficult situation to be in as an ex-football player the video guy you yeah know, these kind of things <laughs> yep, absolutely what do you what do you like about coaching football what is so rewarding because I can I mean I've been at practice I've, I've seen you coach practices and games 200 times and I can tell that you're just very passionate about it why I love the game. I love the I love that everything that goes into it as far as because there's so many elements to it. There's uh, strategic, there's community, there's camaraderie, there's chemistry, yeah. um, there's discipline, there's toughness, there's adversity. It's just like what other game can encompass all those things and put them into one sport like football mm -hmm. does. And um, even something like, you know, football is family type of thing. Right. It's like what other sport has like your fans literally that can play a role in the game that's yeah. being played on the field. Mm -hmm. So it extends out not to just, um, you know, your on field team stuff, but extends in your connection to the fans with it all. Right. So there's all these things that go into it that make it really difficult to win and be successful at which is which has always been just what i think makes me so passionate about yeah <laughs> love it i agree on every single point you feel like you're living the dream then right now you always want to be a football coach i mean absolutely i mean living the dream in the sense of you know i mean i've got a 
um, a, you know, wonderful wife I have support of and mm -hmm. two great little girls. And, you know, I got a, a job that I love to do and in and, and a country I love being in right. and, and feeling very at home at. And, um, you know, so absolutely very blessed in, in, you know, the situation I ended up in. Um, it's been a, a, you know, a long road, yeah. you know, to get to this point, you know, um, uh, to end up in the chair, to have the opportunity to be a head coach uh, in the ELF uh, for sure. Um, but yeah, um, just really love what I'm doing. Let's, let's walk it back a little bit and tell me, talk me through the path of you getting to this position right now. How'd you, how'd you end up in Germany in the first place? And how'd you end up in this chair as the Stuttgart Surge head coach? Yeah, so I played college football and then I also played uh, a little bit of college baseball. And actually I came out, um, Ziggy Garrick, then with the Unicorns, uh, had a great idea. It was the middle of the season. He wanted an American backup quarterback, and but the baseball team in town needed a head coach and a player. And he just found me because I did both. I was a quarterback. I played baseball. And he's like, okay, perfect. So he calls me, mm -hmm. uh, gets me over here. And he knew that pretty quickly that the football was the driving force of me coming. Yeah. And then it was like, okay, uh, in order to make that work, you also need to coach baseball and play baseball, which I was, I loved too. Right. So it was like, oh, for me, it was great. I mean, there were, there were times where I'd play a baseball game in the morning and then as soon as over, I'd race down to the football stadium and I'd play in a football game, that's you know, so on the same sweet. day, yeah, you know. So, so it, it was really fun, you know, those times doing that stuff. And I had like the baseball team working with the football team in a sense that the baseball team would schedule games early. Yeah. That way I wouldn't miss and I could, I could take part in both. So that's really how I got over here. And then, you know, I played four years quarterback for the Unicorns and then started coaching right away. Um, coached there for a couple of years. And then I went uh, and spent three years in Vienna uh, with the Vikings, I was an offensive coordinator there um, for for three years, and then came back to the Unicorns and was there ever since. And then made this move this past offseason. Forgot about that the the Vienna Vikings stints, which of course wouldn't play in the the surge wouldn't play them in the in the regular season, but perhaps in the in the playoffs. Your old uh, head coach Chris Kalaikai. has that been fun being back in the being in the same league as him now and being able to kind of like talk about. You know, yeah. Run the league. I mean, me, me, and, me and Chris are, are very close. Yeah. Um, you know, he's he's always been a great mentor and great friend to me throughout. You know, my time here since I've met him, mm -hmm. uh, we've been very, very close in contact. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's the the interesting dynamic is before all this. I mean, we would be sharing anything and everything, and then now <laughs> there's a little bit of reservation. I mean, we certainly still have a very uh, relationship where we want to see each other succeed sure. to a certain extent, but uh, just if we cross paths, you know, that becomes very different for those three hours and, and stuff. So, um, no, it's been, it's been good. And it's been, for me, it's been really great to kind of ask him questions and yeah. stuff as I've made this transition into the, the ELF like he did one year before. Vienna is just such a, a staple in European football. It's just one of the, I feel like, strongest organizations from top to bottom. Um, with their youth program, with their front office stuff, with their senior team. Can you talk a little bit more about your experience with the Vienna Vikings? And, and what, did you, what did you learn there that you brought back to your, your now head coaching position, your head coaching toolbox? Yeah, I mean, this, um, uh, they did things very different than yeah. the Unicorns. Okay. And, and one's not better than the other. It's yeah. just different, so you got to see a different side of it. Um, I would say you, um, um, being with the Vikings taught me – uh, closer to being a professional coach, right. you know, and, and how to how to handle things that way. Um, and so that was a great blend that I've taken with me even to this day of, you know, feeling like some of the professionalism that the Vikings and, and Chris Kalaika taught me. Um, and and I would say Carl Worm as well there. Yeah. Um, some things I learned very much uh, from the overall organization to learning what I learned with the unicorns from Ziggy Gerke, who takes a totally different approach yeah. to coaching um, and, and both work yeah. and both of these guys are as successful as it gets in Europe. And then just taking those two things and blending them together uh, with obviously my style. So I'd say that was, that was probably what I took away the most from there. And, and that's what's, that's what's been great over the years is to kind of have two mentors like that, that are very different. Yeah. So you had a, a few mentors in the coaching world. What, what would you say then to a young guy getting into coaching? What is your advice? Seek out the smartest coach okay. you know or see 
within your area, especially for European coaches, you can't just pick up and leave and yeah. stuff. Um, find, really seek out someone you admire coaching wise and, and go work with them. I don't care if it's for free, I don't care what it is, um, go because what it's gonna do is it's gonna, you're gonna skip past so many mistakes and stuff you have to learn on the job. You, yeah. just, you just get a head start into your career by learning it from them and then um, then obviously taking your own way after. But that, that would be the biggest advice I would have. How important to you is, I mean, I feel like I know the answer because I've experienced it, but, the, but the, the relationships that you build coaching players off the field, because we've had many talks off the field about life and becoming a man and stuff that has nothing to do with football. Um, how, how, I don't know, how, how do you think about this aspect of being a coach? Because, because you're not, you're not only teaching young men football, <clears throat> but you're being an example of kind of how to carry yourself off the field. What, what is your mentality and thought process on, on this aspect of your relationship with players? Yeah, I think that um, certainly over the years, you have so many conversations off the field about things. Yeah. Um, and it can be anything from just having a fun conversation with somebody to somebody being upset because they'd like to play more or not liking their role in the team or just they have some personal issues going on and, and trying to, to be there for them in that way. And then also uh, what I've always really tried to do is just kind of be a, an example mm -hmm. with how I, you know, conduct myself on and off the field mm -hmm. uh, as well. But really like my number one thing, um, even probably more so than just my personal relationship with the player is how much I care about the experience yeah. that a player has playing for me or playing for a team I'm coaching. Mm -hmm. And because that encompasses so many things that encompasses, uh, how they're treated um, by me, by their coaches, by the organization itself. Um, and that's always something to me that like, if they're gonna come play for a team I'm the head coach of or a part of, I really, really badly want them to walk away with having a great experience. So, mm -hmm. and, and like I said, that encompasses everything. That is, you know, making, even if it's a player that's not that talented, finding a way that they have some moments throughout the season that bring success uh, that they feel that payoff yeah. of, of putting in all that effort and everything they do. So, so like I said, that is probably top of my list. You mentioned before how once you become a head coach, the way that you interact and kind of serve the team changes a little bit. You're not taking your problems to other people. All of the problems are coming up to you and in a way, the higher up you go on the on the totem pole, the more you have to serve. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about this this uh, perspective? Yeah, I mean, head coaching is so much less telling people what to do. It's so much more fulfilling needs mm -hmm. of others. That's that's probably the main job that I have is, is hearing what a, an assistant coach needs. Yeah practice equipment, more time for this drill, uh, more time for that, um, a player needing possibly this piece of equipment or, or wanting to talk about his role in the team of my starter, my backup, stuff like that. So yeah, you're constantly hearing complaints, fulfilling needs as much as you can, because it goes back to the experience thing, because it goes back to wanting to make sure these guys' experience is, is as great as it possibly can be. And then they walk away at the end of the year thinking, man, I really enjoyed that and I want to do it again and come back and do that again. Yeah. So um, you've always got to, and it's, you know, not just me, it's my assistant coaches yeah. and everybody as well know, you know, that's ultimately what we're trying to do. Um, but as a head coach, certainly you're at the top and, and everything will get to you at some point. Back to the surge a little bit this season. What would, what would you consider a success what would you what would it have to what would this season have to look like for it to be a success for your first first year as the head coach of the Stuttgart search the first thing is that the second we step on the field people see a very clear difference yeah. that we've made very clear movements forward that this is a an organization or a franchise that's 
that's doing the right things, that's taking the right steps, that is moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's point one. Uh, point two, to be honest, I'm looking forward to find out myself um, because, you know, we haven't been able to put the full team together yet, just like every elf team, just due to the rules and, and getting everybody together uh, on the football field. And, you know, I myself as a head coach am about to start finding out exactly what we have and, and what uh, what level of team we could be. Right. You know, I certainly have my thoughts and uh, my visions of what that is. But once we hit the field and we see everybody live and going, um, I'll start getting a much better feel of that uh, uh, really soon. I would like to ask you a little bit about the imports, the American imports that you have with the surge this year. A um, few guys that I played with, a few new guys. And can you talk to me a little bit about these American imports that you have and why, with, with, with you only have four A spots, why did you choose these people? Mm -hmm. um, so if I start with our quarterback and Riley Hennessy, um, you know, he's just somebody who's, um, I feel we fit very well together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that's probably the most important point. Um, and, you know, not to mention, oh, by the way, he's just a great football player, you know, in my mind, one of the best football players in Europe. Um, and, you know, he just, um, he's very cerebral, he's very smart. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd say with Riley, it was just kind of a no brainer, just kind of a follow up with the experience we've had over the last, you know, 12 to 14 months together right. or so. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, he was, he was probably my number one target here moving into the off season. Smart guy, math major. Very, very good at chess as well. Very I intelligent. did not know that. So these are these are some other characteristics you want in a quarterback. <laughs> yeah. Good at chess. Yeah. A little bit cocky about his chess game, I would say. You should talk to him about that. But uh, other than that, good guy on and off the field. Yeah. Okay. Who and, else? And, that, and that's it right there. Good guy on and off the field <laughs> yeah. too, with everything else. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then you know we brought in Mitch Fetig. Um, he's another one. Um, played for us last year, and just the reason we love Mitch is just character again. Uh, but. Uh, just versatility, you know, uh, the fact that this guy can can pretty much do it all in, in the secondary uh, is is impressive, you know. So, you watch that German Bowl tape from last year. Yeah, exactly. I My mean, goodness. for somebody to be coming down kind of low in the box or play high or go play man to man uh, on great players, the versatility he has is 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 great. And then, um, you know, Bryce Nunnally, our wide receiver. Uh, we got him very late last year. He didn't get to do a whole lot for us when we were in Schreibisch Hall um, just because of uh, coming in late. Uh, but you saw pretty clearly his talent level and, and what that would be when you extrapolate that out over a full season. And I'm really excited to see Bryce get an opportunity here in Europe to get a full season under his belt uh, as a starter and, and show what he can do on a week-to-week -week basis. And then uh, Kalen Kirst thomas um, just uh, to me, an absolute steal of a find yeah. um you know the it's not often you can go get a guy who played successfully at the highest level like that and not only that but when you turn on the tape um his athleticism stands out yeah. even when you watch the tape at that level um so to find somebody like that um and be able to bring to europe yeah, i think it's going to be pretty exciting for the fans to see absolutely i mean i, I met him last week at friday at practice and just great first impression really liked his energy and just good vibes and uh, you know, i was talking to a couple people like man he seems like a really cool guy and, and of just course, yeah. smart as yeah. well i was impressed this last couple of days just talking to him yeah and that's another thing you just sit and talk to me just an intelligent you know young man who can talk to you about di several different topics you, you know you really upgraded at the mike linebacker in position. <laughs> would, you, would you say that coach would you put that <laughs> I, won't, I won't make that comment i will not say that well we'll see we'll see what he looks like here for those who don't know i used to be coach newman's mike import uh so you could say kevin's my replacement <laughs> no i'm super excited about all of them um and then the e imports as well a couple guys you know that you're re relinking with one that a lot of people are excited about goran zach Yep. God, baller. I would almost say Goron really took off and grew with us in Trevish Hall. I think Goron was 17, 18, 19, yeah. if I remember. Um, and he, where he really started to find his stride. Um, and then just, you know, in those moments, like really just took off. And you see it over the last couple of years in the ELF. He's become one of the best players in the league. Yeah. So, I mean, he was certainly one of the guys we reached out to first in the offseason of, of really wanting to get him. Uh, over, you know, and then 
Osno Robo, running back. Um, I think I'm really excited to see him because he's somebody who's spent time in the CFL the last years. Yeah. Um, hasn't got a, much of an opportunity over there, but for obvious reasons, I mean, it's the CFL. It's one of the highest levels you can possibly play football at. Um, so now to get him over here and have him be a starting running back on a week to week basis, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun uh, to see. And then Philip Velasti, defensive lineman who brings elf experience, had a great year uh, with Frankfurt in uh, the inaugural season. You know, he's comes with college football experience yeah. and uh, no doubt, you know, he's going to be he's going to be a really good one as well. And then Yannick Meyer also, you know, another guy who's played in Trevish Hall, who just brings lightning speed with him. Um, I think will fit really good into the offense. Sure. Alessandro Fragani um, is probably not a better leader I've ever been around and seen. Uh, one of the best O-linemen in Europe. And then um, uh, Pepe De La Vecchia, um, you know, just uh, just uh, a missile, somebody who, who just flies around and plays ball. So um, really feel good about every one of those spots right. that we were able to get. And uh, like I said, this, that's, I just named off about 10 guys right. that we haven't seen on the field together mixed in with our very very talented german players that we have so yeah let's just say that the last chunk of players you know you got your a's you got your e's and then you've got your your homegrown guys how are you feeling about this group yeah and i mean kind of you said you know you got your a's your e's your homegrowns but i mean there's a lot of homegrowns who match right up there with your a's and e's exactly. you know what i mean um so you know i hesitate to <clears throat> start going through all the names yeah. uh, we have of our homegrowns uh just because you know I, I don't want to leave anybody out but there's certainly guys here i showed up who i knew who a lot of people in the elf know there's some guys who people in the elf don't know that are about to have breakout seasons uh that are being very good football players i was very proud that we had 11 guys on the uh, german national team 100. yeah um so i think that was a great number that shows uh, we got a good amount of of very talented football players uh, doesn't matter um, what nationality they are. What do you have to say to Stuttgart Surge fans? What do they have to expect for this season? What do you want to leave them with? Yeah, I'll, I'll just leave them with um, they're going to come out and see a very different football team mm -hmm. that they've seen over the last two years. And, and I understand that, um, you know, it's a growing process. It's a growing process to rebuild a franchise and, and rebuild football teams. And even for the past regime of coaches who have been here, uh, that's not an easy thing to start from zero. Um, so, you know, we did have an advantage that we came in with, you know, there's a little bit of a foundation here that we wanted to build off of. Um, and, and I think this in year three was the year uh, the Stuttgart Surge were able to take its biggest steps forward. And uh, to our fans that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons myself and my staff came here is because we heard how Ghazi can get rocking and the fan support and uh, the love uh, the city of Stuttgart has for their football team. And uh, we're going to do everything we can to put a great product on the field that they can be proud of. Coach Jordan Newman, head coach, the Stuttgart Surge. Thanks for coming on the show, Coach. Appreciate it.